Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey guys, welcome to The Team House. This is episode 102. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. We're enjoying a scotch tonight. I hope you are too. Uh, and our guest tonight is Steve Silva. Steve served for 21 years with the Diplomatic Security Service, or DSS, uh, serving in Belgrade in Algeria. He was all over Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, so had a pretty long career over there in DSS. And we're really excited to talk to him tonight. He is the author of the book, Afghans Never Smile. Uh, you can see it behind him. It's a memoir about his time with DSS, if you guys want to go check it out on Amazon. So, Steve, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's an honor, and I, I greatly appreciate you guys uh, having me on your show. Yeah, man, it's super cool because you're the first DSS dude, DSS agent that we've had on the show. Um, so I think it'll be interesting for our audience, too, that they, they've heard from all these other dudes all yeah. across the federal <laughs> government, but not too yeah. many people know about DSS or what it is that you guys do. And, um, you know, it's one of those jobs where I know it's a cliche from back in the day from the army, but it's not a job, it's an adventure. And it really sounds like DSS is, is like that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to tell us all about it, but you know, the, the, uh, First question, of course, that we ask all our guests is what their origin story is. And so we'd like to hear a little bit about where you come from and what kind of led you into this life of uh, federal service. Uh, I'm from Boston, actually. I don't know if you can tell in my accent, but I grew <laughs> up in Boston. Uh, big Boston sports fan. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, and he told a lot of stories, a lot of cool stories about serving your country. And... Um, so that, that kind of led me to wanting to have a, uh, you know, a life of service, if you will. And I, I joined the Army. I went to uh, officer candidate school, and uh, I was a platoon leader in Germany during the end of the Cold War. Okay. Uh, and my younger brother was in the Marines, so we kind of, you know, two of, two of, we, I have uh, three brothers. Two of us went in the service. So, um, you know, but that was... Harry, my father, and, and my uncle tell their Navy stories. That kind of got me into, you know, that's I wanted to do something like that. I wanted to serve. Um, stayed in the Army for so many years, got out, did, you know, I uh, did four years. Um, and then uh, I was working in the private sector, and a friend of mine who worked with me used to work for the U.S. Information Agency. Oh, yeah, the predecessor yeah, way, to the NSA. Yeah, yeah, way back. And he said, you know, uh, I just saw this... Um, this advertisement in the Boston Globe about this job, DSS. And I, I saw those DSS guys when I was with USIA. And, you know, your background, you'd be great. Uh, he, he knew that I had, uh, I had actually tried to get into the CIA. And I, I, I went through the first interview, got through that, took one of the tests, got through that. But I somehow I didn't meet their uh, psychological requirements or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I, did, I didn't get through that. So, uh, uh, so DSS came along, I applied for it, you know, it took like, uh, I applied for it in and beginning of 1998. And then, uh, in, uh, September of 98, we had, uh, Nairobi, the Nairobi bombings, if you remember. And, uh, because of the, uh, emb the embassies of Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were bombed and DSS needed more agents. So that kind of pushed me up along the, the way. And, uh, I was able to get uh, and stated in 1999. So that's my origin story. What What were you doing um, in the private sector in that time? I actually worked for a computer company. Oh wow! <laughs> and I was in the uh, I was in the National Guard for a while too. But uh, I was kind of bored, and uh, you know, again, there was that whole I want to serve my country thing and keep it going. So that's why, yeah, I took a shot at DSS, and uh, I was lucky to get in. Were, were you just? kind of bored with your job in the army or did it not like meet your expectations yeah there's a lot of uh there's a lot of things going on there i mean uh i was married at the time and uh my wife hated it yeah and uh so yeah. i ended up getting out because of that and yeah. then you know i'm not married to her anymore so yeah. uh but uh it was one of those things that was i mean i'm not going to blame it all on her but yeah there was you know that that kind of got me out of it and yeah. uh 
uh, I was able to get a job real, really quickly when I got out. And, um, but I, again, it was, it just, I was a run of the mill, wasn't a bad job, but it just wasn't something that, you know, sure. was exciting, you know? Sure. So when you got hired by DSS, like what was that process once you got in, like, and what was the training like and things like that? Right. So we, uh, we go to the federal law enforcement training center in Glencoe, Georgia, like all Every federal agent goes there except for the FBI and DEA. Every, everybody else goes there for their initial basic training to learn to become an investigator. Once you complete FLETC, then you go, then you went to the DSS add-on training up in Dunlawren, Virginia. And uh, also at, at that time, it was Bill Scott Raceway up in West Virginia. Um, so when you go to the add-on training for DSS, it was basically teaching you protection and uh DSS has been on investigations. And then also at Bill Scott Raceway, we learned how to do anti-terrorism drivers training. Mm -hmm. So we, we did all kinds of crazy stuff with uh, cars that you'd never dream of, you know, to, to, to learn how to get off the X, if you will, you know, the X. So, Steve, what is diplomatic security service? Yeah. What's, what's the job? Okay. We, we have like three missions. Uh, we have a domestic mission and an overseas mission. Domestically, we do passport and visa fraud investigations. So if somebody's fraudulently getting passports or visas, we invest, we do the investigations for that. And a lot of times terrorism is tied into that because terrorists are trying to get into the U.S. So we're, we're involved with the FBI and with uh, 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 Homeland Security investigations, you know, in those lines. We also do domestic protection. We protect the Secretary of State and then we protect all diplomats with threats on them when they come here and other diplomats that are our allies like France, uh, UK and so forth and Germany. Um, but we also protect people that don't, that aren't uh, from a nation state, if you will. We protect the Dalai Lama when he comes here. Mm -hmm. We protect the Royal family when they come here. We protect Prince Harry. I got the, I was lucky enough to protect Prince Harry uh, back in, uh, uh, 2016 for the Invictus Games, you know, it was a great experience. But um, yeah, so we protect people like that over here. And then overseas, we protect our embassies and our diplomats. So, and, and you have the job as a regional security officer, and then you have a few other assistant regional security officers that can work with you. And um, our role is to protect people, property, and information. So that's basically what we're doing. Um, in Afghanistan, I was actually at Bagram Air Force Base. I wasn't at an embassy because we had a State Department platform at Bagram. We had State Department uh, officers and we had U U uh, USAID, United States Agency for International Development uh, officers there. So we protected all of them. And then we had a senior civilian rep who was basically uh, a an ambassador. Her name was Karen Decker. And uh, we protected her. So that, that was our, you know, so that was kind of a special thing. Uh, you know, we had DS agents at, at Bagram. We had DS agents at Kandahar Airfield. We had DS agents at Camp Leatherneck because we had high level um, diplomats there uh, advising the, you know, the army, you know, in, in terms of uh, engagement with the Afghans. On Bagram, did you guys have to wear safety belts across your... Uh you know, when you're walking down the street. No, we were, uh, no, uh, you know, I, I used to feel bad because, uh, you know, general order number one, you know, uh, yeah. those, those poor guys couldn't drink, but we, you know, us, us DS guys kind of teamed up with the CIA guys there and we made sure that we had our, our, uh, covert, uh, shipment of alcohol that would, you know, certainly made our year go by a lot faster than those four, uh, soldiers there. I yeah. used to feel bad for them. I bet. So what what kind how long was the the DSS specific training once you guys left Fletzy? Uh, it was like another three or four months, uh, but it's even gotten longer now because the mission back when I came on in 1999, we didn't have you know we didn't have 9/11, um, so we weren't we weren't doing the expeditionary diplomacy, if you will, back in '99 that we were uh, that we are now. You know, since since nine eleven until now, where DS agents are posted not just at embassies, but we're in we're in war zones. You know, oh, and right. uh, uh, if you look at Iraq, we were 
we were not just in Baghdad. We were also in Mosul. We were in Erbil. We were in Basra. Uh, we were in uh, Hilla. We were in a lot of, because we were stationed at PRTs. Uh-huh. So um, there was a lot of that going on. And, and the PRTs uh, are the Provisional Reconstruction Teams. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, That's okay. Provisional Reconstruction yeah. Teams. Correct, correct. Yeah. So. Or prevention? Yeah. It's, I don't know. But yeah, a reconstruction team, basically. I'll buy yeah, it. Yeah, it's provisional reconstruction team, yep. yeah. Which is usually manned by, uh, you know, an, not just an army officer, like the provisional reconstruction team in Ghazni that I worked a lot with was manned, was was commanded by a Navy, a Navy commander. So he was the PRT commander. And then Ghazni was a special place. There was actually a lot of sailors in, in the uh, PRT there. Really? And what? Why was DS there? Were, were there State Department personnel attached to that? Yeah, when um, Karen Decker was our our ambassador, if you will, stationed at uh, at Bagram, she was basically designated as like a two star general. So she got General Townsend's helicopters pretty much whenever she wanted, and uh, she went out. Sometimes she went out with General Townsend. Sometimes she went out with the ISAF commander. Or sometimes she went out by herself. And every time, if she went to a, a FOB and stayed on the FOB, we didn't go with her. But if she did, but if she went to a FOB and then went off the FOB, then we went with her as body, you know, basically as her protective uh, element. Mm -hmm. So um, so she did a lot of engagement. She was out, uh, God, she she went out a lot. I would say at least once or twice a week we were, we were uh, flying in a helicopter with her. To uh, you know, Fob Ghazni or Fob Rushmore, uh, you know, you, anywhere in our, this woman. This woman traveled everywhere in RCEs. She was a she was a machine. That, that's amazing to hear because that's not yeah. something that like I was aware of that the State Department was so active or that she was so active. Yeah, she was, and uh, actually Townsend. Anytime he went out, he wanted her with her. Um, you know, because he saw her as, uh, you know, a force multiplier, if you will, to deal with the Afghans. Uh, and, uh, you know, Karen, to her credit, was pretty rough. I mean, she, <laughs> you know, she wasn't one of those uh, stereotypical uh, passive aggressive diplomats. She, I, I, I was there a few times when she told the Afghans that, you know, they were full of shit. And, uh, hey, we're giving you we're giving you millions of dollars. So you need to uh, lighten up a little bit, you know. So, yeah. Interesting. So after your training at FLETC and then the DSS, like what, what was your first posting and, and what did you think about yeah. it? So my first posting was like at, a, at the Washington field office. We have a number of field offices all around the United States. And basically at the field offices, that's when you're doing your passport and visa fraud investigations. And that's when you're doing your, um, your protection assignments. And I was in, uh, I was at the Washington DC field office and, uh, we didn't get a chance to do a lot of investigations because we were helping out with protection all the time mm -hmm. because, of course, everybody wants to come to D.C. So we were doing that. We were also uh, like a, a farm system for the uh, secretary's detail. So I got to uh, the Washington field office in um, January of 2000. And three weeks later, I was on the secretary's detail for 45 days because they needed people because Madeleine Albright at the time was – you know, she's a, you know, love to travel and they needed the extra body. So I got my uh, baptism in uh, the secretary's detail right away. Steve, out of curiosity, how is it like coordinating with either Secret Service or when Madeleine Albright's traveling and meeting dignitaries from other countries and they have their security, coordinating with them, is there seniority? Are there conflicts and issues at times? Oh, yeah. Uh, for example, um, if you go on a presidential visit, like if uh, if the sex state goes goes to a country X, Y, or Z by themselves, you know they get top priority. But when the sex state goes with the president, it's it's it can get kind of ugly because the Secret Service. Uh, I love those guys, but they were pretty rough to deal with. So uh, we we didn't get a like for example, you have the sex secretary of state. I remember Marilyn Albright. We were in a uh, Berlin. And when Clinton was president, of course, and they walk out together out of the venue together to go to this next meeting. They're supposed to be together. 
he gets in the, the very first vehicle and they told, and our limo was vehicle number 35. Wow. She was pissed. Yeah. <laughs> she was pissed, you know? So, uh, and it's hard to explain. We try to explain that to secret service guys. Like, Hey man, she, she's a sex state, you know? So, yeah. And then what about in other countries? I recently saw a video and I don't, I think it was Russians in uh, a Middle Eastern country. I can't remember wh where, like, the Russian security was trying to go in, and they were stopped by other security forces of the of the host nation. Like, were there those types of conflicts where you, people are keeping you from doing your job? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know what? Um, one of the uh, biggest uh, fights, if you will, I ever uh, witnessed and was a little bit part of uh, uh, the Turks. The Turks are famous for being... Uh, they just their their protective details are just uh, very non professional, uh, very heavy handed. Uh, they like they like to fight. So um, we we also protect anytime the head of the Palestinian Authority comes to the U.S. Mahmoud Abbas, we protect him. So this is a few years ago at the UN General Assembly. I was protecting the Foreign Minister of Bahrain. And he was sitting in the same, he was sitting with the foreign minister of Pakistan. Abbas war, walked into the room in the far corner and our DS agents had him there. And the Turkish detail when Erdogan, President Erdogan wanted to speak to him really bad. And I guess the Turks were really heavy handed with the uh, UN security there. And uh, they started the fight with UN security. I saw the, the Turkish advance agent pull the uh, UN security uh, agent by the lapel of his jacket pulled him down. And uh, so the, the UN security guy got up and punched him in the face. And there's a brawl right there in this, you know, uh, wow. bilat room where all the bilats are going on. So I, you know, my guy was sitting on a couch. So I was, I was luckily enough to be standing behind the couch and was able, the, the scrum basically came on top of us. I had to push him off, push them off. And I said, sir, we got to go. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the foreign minister of Bahrain, but he weighs over 300 pounds. And, um, and he's, a, he's a big football fan. He, uh, he, he went to school in uh, Texas, so he's a Cowboys fan. So he literally said this to me, Steve, I will be, I will be the offensive lineman. You get behind me and I will push through. And I was like, okay, sir, and we did. We, we pushed through. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then we went down to the drop where all the vehicles are, and um, we got in and drove away. But then I found out later that when we our guys tried to get a bus out of the uh, UN, the Turks followed him. And uh, we got a bus in the limo, and our agent in charge turned around, and there was a Turkish guy in the front seat of our limo. So he pulled him out. And then Erdogan jumped in our limo, and uh, there was a big brawl between our agents and the uh, Turkish agents right at the right at the entrance to the UN wow. under this big under this big tent, and uh, I don't know to this day how that never got out because you know all those diplomats and they all stand down there smoke and whatever and hang out. I I would have thought that would have got on a cell phone or you know something, yeah. but it never did. So yeah, yeah, it I was a it was a famous before. battle. We're pretty proud of it. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and and I mean uh, it kind of goes to show or go to speaks to uh, why that particular country is such a fucking shit show right now oh god they're they're the worst they're the worst <laughs> i i you know it was funny because after that happened we had the nato summit i don't remember the nato summit in chicago a few years ago there was all these demos and stuff and um i got a phone call and it said hey you know we gotta we gotta ask a favor of you will you protect the uh will you work the uh the foreign minister of turkey so you because we think you can keep his uh his turkish guys in line and i was like you gotta be kidding me really and they're like, no, well, whatever you want, you got it. Well, you know, and so I went to Chicago with them and it was the same thing. They were, um, I'll just give you a real good example. Like we, he was, uh, the foreign minister of Turkey was having a meeting with a Angela Merkel at her hotel. So myself and the Turkish agent in charge went to the meeting and the Germans are very precise. You know, they're like, you know, the only people who come to this meeting with with the uh, with the foreign minister are you, Steve, and one Turk, and that is it. Like, I look at the Turkish guy. You got that? Yep. Okay. Next day, we show up at the meeting. We get in the elevator, and there's four Turkish guys in there with us. You know, and I'm like, 
what are you doing? And uh, they're like, oh, we must go in this way. I'm like, nah, you know. And the elevator opens up on Merkel's floor. And the Germans, they must have known because they were waiting in mass. And yeah. uh, there, there was a big fight right at the elevator between the Turks and the Germans. And I'm just like, I'm looking at my Turkish counterpart like, come on, buddy. You know, you guys are just unbelievable. You know, it's just that's what that's the way they are. When you say a fight, do you mean like a brawl or? I mean a brawl. I mean a fist fight. Yeah. Like- that's insane. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> How do things yeah, I, like that get resolved without somebody really getting hurt? I mean, are there gentlemen's rules to it or? Yeah, it's just, you know, I, it, it doesn't happen with anyone else other than the Turks. I swear to God, the Russians, you know, for the most part, we can work with them. You know, um, the Israelis are a real pain in the ass um, because they don't want to listen to us and they got their own set of rules. But um the Turks are the worst. Not even, not even close. Yeah, that's crazy. That's so crazy. Yeah. let's uh, let's start talking about some of these uh, overseas assignments. Like I think you said, the first place you got assigned was Belgrade. Yeah, I was there. I was there actually for a TDY after uh, it was it was uh, two thousand one. So it was about a year and a half after um, after the war in Kosovo. Um, so I was protecting the U.S. ambassador in Montgomery and. Uh, you know, there was still there was still a lot of stuff going on in Serbia. You know, if you remember back then, um, Arkan, that guy. Yeah. I don't know if you remember him, mm-hmm. but that thug, that guy, he ended up getting killed before I got there. But his people were still running around, so we were really concerned about uh, we were really concerned about you know them coming after the ambassador because he he loved to walk everywhere. So, and uh, we tried to talk him out of it, um, but he wouldn't. You know, he wanted to walk. Whenever he could. So, I mean, you're walking through downtown Belgrade and the buildings are still blown up from 1999. You know, the defense ministry is like a pile of rubble. We'd walk by it every day. And it's just like, okay, you know. Uh, but, you know, the thing I remember most about Belgrade is that I basically had a bunch of Serbs working for me uh, in my detail. My driver was a Serb. The follow car driver was a Serb. The advance agent was a Serb. And I'll tell you, these guys were just, a, what a great bunch of guys. Um, they were just awesome to work with. Um, didn't hold anything against us for, you know, basically, you know, we fought a war with their country. And they took a lot of heat because they're working for the Americans, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, that, that's really the, the thing I remember most about, about that. And also, um, we actually had... I. I the ambassador was trying to get Serbia to extradite Milosevic to the uh, the Hague. So the whole time I was there, I was we were sneaking him into secret meetings with all these uh, Serbian politicians in the government, try to convince them to uh, put him on a you know a plane to the Hague and get rid of him. Um, so it was a lot a lot of subterfuge. We were sneaking him into all these different meetings. All the meetings took place in the middle of the night. Uh, but one of the ones I remember most was we went, we had a meeting with the prime minister, Zoran Zinjic. He's the prime minister. He's the chief, you know, head of state. And uh, the Serbians got guys uh, advanced the, the meeting for me. And I get there and it's this rundown apartment building. And I'm like, is this real? Is this really, you know, they're like, yeah, this is where he lives. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So we go up in this elevator. And I swear it was one of those ones you kind of do this, you know, to, to get out there and uh, just run down apartment building. And they're like, his is his, his room. So I, I'm like, okay, I knock on the door and the prime minister answers the door. You know, I mean, I don't know of any other country in the world where you'll, you'll knock on a door in an apartment, uh, apartment and the prime minister answers the door, you know? And uh, what I remember, he was such a, he was a really nice guy. So that was in 2001, you know, fast forward, um, and he had no protection. That was the other thing. He had no protection. There was nobody there protecting him. Um, and, and the lighting was so bad in that building. I mean, it was dusk, but it was pitch dark inside the building. So fast forward uh, to 2005, I was an instructor at the DS Training Center, and I, we were doing a post-blast training at Fort AP Hill. And I got up. That morning, you know, worked out or whatever, turned the TV on, and I'm watching the news, and it's saying that Zoran Djindjic was assassinated by Serb mafia, you know. And I was thinking, wow, what a nice guy, but the man had no 
protection. You know, the guys told me he wanted to be a man of the people, you know, right, and I was like, right. well, yeah. Yeah. That's like such a, uh, I mean, not so much for us in America anymore, but like that was a debate once, you know, with, should the president have like the open air limo and he's waving to the people right. and yeah, we had some bad experiences with that, of course. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Well, even the Pope you know, had the, the Pope mobile. Yeah, know, yeah, they, yeah they, exactly. Yeah. It, get, it yeah. gets to the point where they have to balance right. their desire to be accessible with their life, you know. Or yeah, don't, we don't we don't need the Archduke Ferdinand kind of uh, incident going down. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. Maybe the armor but, limo is a good idea. But yeah, it was just a weird thing. You knock on the door, and I thought you know some guy would answer, but it was him. I'm like, holy crap! Hey, hey, sir, how you doing? Was was the Department of State uh, through through your travels, and we'll keep going chronologically. But were they good about generally, in general, supporting the ambassadors, like having the armored vehicles you needed, having the assets and resources that you needed to take care of them? Yeah, I mean, we had. I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's we always had armored vehicles for for the ambassador. No, no question about it. Um, but you got to remember, DSS is, is, is only has 20, 20, 2,100 agents, very small agency, whereas the FBI, I think, has, what, 20 or 30,000 agents? So we were used to getting, you know, getting by with what we had. So right. a lot of times we had to, you know, kind of just, you know, we couldn't do things by the book all the time. So a lot of times we have uh, in these countries – we like, for example, when I was in Peshawar, I was the only DS agent there. The rest of my guys who were doing protection for us were local Pakistani police officers. So we had to depend on them to help us out. Uh, so in Peshawar, it was just me, uh, my um, what we call a Foreign Service National Investigator, which is usually a retired police officer or retired soldier from that country that works with us. He's like, he or she is like the RSO's right hand man, other than his other agents, because normally it's somebody who has spent 30 or 40 years in the security apparatus of that country and they're helping us. Mm -hmm. So we depend on that quite a lot, you know? And uh, so I think a lot of, we were, we were used to, we're used to getting by with, with not like we don't have, the, we don't have the resources that say secret service does. We just mm -hmm. don't. So I think we've gotten better at it since, especially since Benghazi, you know, we've learned some lessons, um, but you know, uh, you know, so do we have like armored vehicles and, and the weaponry and all that? Yes, we do. Do we have enough of the manpower? Yeah. There were days when we probably could have used a lot more. Yeah. 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 Especially if you're just one person that that's seven days a week, 24 hours a day with no break working with locals yeah, yeah. working yeah. with locals especially in places yeah. like pakistan where they're so infiltrated that you never know uh, who's at your gate yeah yeah i mean yeah no i mean uh my fsni and peshawar was this guy named Tarak khan he was a former lieutenant colonel in the pakistani army and he was an amazing person he everybody at the embassy loved this guy every you know uh he would did everything he could to help us out now i mean who knows what ISI was, was doing to him in the background, you know? Right. Um, God only knows, you know. I'm sure he had to deal with a lot of crap. Right. Because they're horrible, you know, as I'm sure you know. Right. But, um, you know, uh, he, he was amazing. Uh, uh, that guy, him and me, we, we advanced so many sites in the tribal areas. I, I, I've been to every tribal area except for North and South Waziristan, and I just, it was just me and him. And it was basically run silent, run deep. Uh, we didn't tell anybody we were going out there. We we uh, made contact with the with the tribal police, the Pakistani police. And uh, if you, I don't know if you know anything about the tribal areas, but if you're a foreigner, you cannot go there. There's actually a sign that says no foreigners. And uh, the cops would stop us, and uh, Tarek would be like, they'd be like, he's a foreigner, and he'd be like, no, he's not. <laughs> And you see what I look like, right? Yeah. I got blue eyes, whatever. I had, I had 5'11s on, a polo shirt, whatever. And uh, they're like, okay, we go through. And, uh, you know, we went to the Kyber Agency. I don't know how many times. We went to Bajor, which is a pretty bad place. We went to Maman. So, um, you know, every, 
we in our job at DSS, we gotta we gotta depend on the locals to help us out, and that's why. You know, when this whole when we talked, to, you know, when the Muslim ban happened, it was it was really hard for me to take because, man, in Algeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all those people helped us out, man. They 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 laid their lives on the line. Their, you know, their everything to help us out because not because they're gonna get anything, but they really they they think pretty highly of this country still. You know, right. so that was a that was a tough pill to swallow for me. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. So after, uh, so are there any other things notable in Belgrade that went down while you were there? Uh, the, 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 the most notable thing, I was kind of like a footnote in history because my last day in Belgrade was the day that Milosevic got extradited to The Hague. So I kind of felt like, you know, I had something to do with that. Sure. So, <laughs> what? so we... We did. We not, I said like we we snuck people. We snuck our ambassador into all these meetings, and I remember like again we knocked on the door, and the one of the vice presidents of Serbia answers. We go in. We go into the house. He goes into the meeting. I'm basically sitting with the vice president of Serbia's wife, and she makes me cookies. Uh, it was just kind of like wow, okay, you know. And uh, so um, it it was it was an interesting experience. That's for sure. You know, you worked with foreigners so much and relied on them so much. For instance, when Special Forces does their yeah. training, they're trained in how to interact with foreign nations, and, and, you know, it's part of the thing. Was that part of your training, or was this something you just had to adapt to on the fly? Yeah, you kind of had to adapt to it. I mean, I think when you, when you apply to DSS and you figure out what the job is, and it's like, okay, well, I've always wanted to travel. I've always wanted to see, meet people, and, you know, so... I think you got to be that kind of a person. But one thing I do remember, I, my last assignment was that um, I was a DSS liaison officer for, at Indo Paycom, and it was Secret Service. It was part of our Secret Service agent that was part of our uh, platform there. And um, we were talking one day, and he said, "You know, the, the the thing that amazes me about you DSS guys is no matter what country I go to, you guys blend right in. You fit right in." He goes, us Secret Service guys just can't do that. We're not good at that, but you guys are. So, I, I, you know, I don't know what it is, but, yeah, when you get to country X, Y, or Z, you just, I just get, the, I used to get the mindset, is like, I got I to gotta work with these people. I got to, you know. Yeah. Tell us, I, I, uh, you know. Tell us what it was like working in Algeria, because that was your next, like, you know, quote, unquote, high threat assignment, right? Right. And uh, Algeria, I was lucky enough to get there, you know, uh, peace was breaking out um so the gspc if you remember those guys were they were they were losing they weren't doing well so um things weren't too bad there uh but the thing i remember is that we had a lot of algerian bodyguards that, that you know they always had a ds agent on our ambassador there but the all the, our whole team once again was all algerian guys and um the thing I remember most about those guys is that everyone, everyone in their family, they had lost, everybody had lost somebody in their family, you know, because uh, the Islamist uh, fundamentalists, the GSPC were vicious. They, you know, they, uh, they killed, a, they killed a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, in indiscriminately in Algiers and so forth. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you, I, I remember I went to the far, uh, the finance ministry with our ambassador and I, I met the head of security there and he's telling me his story and he had this big family that lived in a village outside of Algiers and um, uh, the GSPC came through and, and killed his, yeah, he had, like, uh, I think it was nine members of his family. So he had a big family, his mom, his dad, and uh, all his brothers and sisters. And one sister survived because she hid in a closet and they didn't look in there. So when you hear that kind of a story, you know, it's, it's like, wow, this, you know, um, we did have uh, one situation where we had a terrorist cell in Algiers, a GSPC cell, and uh, I ended up befriending a member of the Algerian uh, Special Forces because he helped me do security at a uh, at a job site, a job fair that we took we actually took part in this job fair. Uh, so he helped us do security for our pavilion. And he was a good guy, and him, him and his whole team were trained by the CIA. He told me that much. And then uh, 
I didn't see him again until our 4th of July party, which all the locals show up at the 4th of July party at the embassy. And he was doing security. And I saw him outside the front gate. And we had heard, we had heard that this terrorist cell got taken out about a week prior. And nobody knew anything. The CIA guys didn't know nothing. Nobody understood what happened. So I run into, his name was Bedradine, I remember. And I'm like, hey, Bedradine, how you doing, man? And I'm like, so what happened with that terrorist cell? He's like, oh, I'm glad you asked. I was the guy that took it out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, well, what happened? He's like, yeah, all the neighbors there saw them doing some crazy, you know, just stuff that didn't seem right. So we got the call. We did surveillance. We figured out there was a terrorist cell there. So I called him up at 3 in the afternoon and said, you have one hour to, to surrender. And at 4 o'clock, they were all dead. You know, so uh, that was his story. <laughs> so, no, nope, you know, I just happened to like, luckily befriend him, and we got the report, you know, so we were able to report Holy back shit. to Washington what happened to that terrorist cell. That's so, fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he was one of those guys, you look at him, it's like, he's a killer, you know? <laughs> were, were you a student? I mean, did you follow international events and and – and whatnot before you got into DSS or was like going into these situations in Belgrade and in Algiers and stuff, was it a big education for you about the outside world or the world outside the U S yeah, I was kind of a weirdo. I guess I was a big history buff. I, I read a lot about, I, I, you know, my wife will tell you that, uh, look at our bookcase. I get so many damn books that, um, so yeah, I did a lot of reading. I, you know, I, you know, I, I definitely, it was a goal of mine to travel the world. And, you know, I got to go to 45 countries through wow. DSS. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was something that was something I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, it was a dream, but, you know, you don't think that's ever going to happen, you know, but but it did. So, guys, before we yeah. go on, oh, yeah. I just want to give a, uh, a quick word from our sponsor. You know, if you're going on all these inter international adventures, you might want to use uh, do some male grooming beforehand because you never know what's going to happen. And right now, summer's coming, and we are here to talk about the performance package 4.0 from Manscaped. Uh, if you're ready to unveil your beach bod or the old twig and berries, as it were, you're in luck because our friends at Manscaped just launched their fourth generation performance package, which includes the lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Compliment your summer bod with a trim from the leaders in male grooming. The sun is shining and calling your name. <laughs> Join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get ready for hot guy summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code TEAM20. Oh, we, yeah. And so we got some of this gear to show off here. This is uh, the Shears 2.0. Got some scissors in here, some clippers, some tweezers. So this is the new 4.0. They use like a ceramic head. It has a little light. I don't, I, I don't want to get all up in your business, Steve. But for me, <laughs> in the past, when I've tried to groom, it's always there's always been the risk of tr you know uh, snipping or or you know cutting. That this has like a ceramic head. It has a little shield, so you don't do that. It also has a little light to you know guide you through the. Uh, under the nether region of the scrote as yeah. you're kind of doing that motion. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also with Manscaped, they have the weed whacker, which was nose and hair. I actually need the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do I too. Got I'm going to, yeah, gonna, I definitely need that. I'm yeah. Getting, getting old. Yeah. I, ears, that, ears, yeah. Ears, me ears. too. Well, actually, both for me, but my ears yeah. go crazy fast now. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, here they have the refined uh, cologne, which we haven't used, but I have used, they have a, a ball tonic. A aftershave, which is very refreshing. And don't, then, don't ask me. I wouldn't know. And then also a deodorant because nobody wants a sweaty package. D, oh, you you used so. it? Yeah. No. It. And you've you been like in some hot places, yeah. right, Steve? And you, like, I have. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah and, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, guys, get 20% off plus free shipping with uh, the code TEAM20 at manscaped.com. It's 20% off plus free shipping along with the code TEAM20 at manscaped.com. Escape the shrubs and weeds this summer and shine with Manscaped. All right. Shine. So, <laughs> Algeria, you're a fan of history. Uh, anything else in, uh, of interest happen in Algeria? Um. We had, we had, you know, we had a few bombings in the city, um, but 
you know, actually, like I said, Algeria, we had, we did have, t we had two police officers killed outside of our, uh, outside of our embassy grounds, but thankfully nothing, you know, happened on the embassy grounds itself. So, but other than that, that was pretty much it. Um, before you know, we, we uh, before we jump into um, Pakistan, um, I think I got some user questions here for you. Uh, okay. Richard, thank you. D. Kroll, thank you. Ty, thank you. Andrew asks, doesn't DSS pursue sex tourists too? Well, you know, it's, we actually team up with the U.S. Marshals. We actually act as U.S. Marshals overseas. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, so we have a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. Marshals Service. Uh, so we're, we're deputized to bring back fugitives. And I'll tell you, a lot of them are just like that. They're pedophile sex. And, and they, a lot of them end up going to uh, Central America. They like to hide there. Um, you know, a lot of them are in Thailand. But uh, if the U.S. Marshals find somebody, we work with them. If they find out that somebody thereafter is in country X, Y, or Z, we basically work with the local police to spirit that person out of there. And uh, we, we take them back to the U.S. Now, a lot of times, you know, you got extradition treaties, which can be a real pain in the ass. But if we got a good, our job as an RSO is to have a really good relationship with the local police because we need them to help us secure the embassy itself, the outer perimeter. And a lot of times we are, we, we provide training. We bring them back to the States, give them training. We try to, you know, it's a quid pro quo kind of thing. So if we got a good relationship with the police, um, we can kind of like skirt those extradition things. If you know, if you know what I mean. So, um, so yeah, we we do we we bring back a lot of pedophiles hiding out overseas. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. we're, we're, talking, only we're talking about real scumbags here, not like you know the sailor coming off the ship and you know no, consensually no. hiring a, a prostitute no. perhaps in the no, Philippines. No, 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 no. Like, yeah. But we're talking. A lot about of guys like are getting this, heart palpitations you know, out there listening to so this, forth. right? But <laughs> but there was, but there was, but on but on the like tourist after that type of stuff yeah, overseas. Yeah. No, there, no, 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 no. Huh? No, uh, I, no. Uh, that that's interesting. Yeah, you're going after scumbags. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, D yeah. crawl. Thank you. Uh, Jim G says, did Steve work with Frank Theus or Gary Coldwell? Frank who? Theus? Theus. No, I don't. Or Gary yeah, either one of them. Neither okay. one of those names ring a bell. Oh, uh, D. Kroll actually also said, finally figured out. I think that he like messed it up on that one. He said, howdy, Steve. So D. Kroll. Oh, hey. I love that guy. He's great. <laughs> and John... <laughs> Oh, and John says, I'm guessing those Turkish security guys could use the 4.0, not the stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew says, uh, the U.S. Marshals are bros like that, deputizing chaps left and right. Rayland Givens. Uh, not sure who that's a reference to. Ty says, what makes for a competitive applicant to DS? Ah, uh, well, it's funny because DSS is... Uh I won't lie. Most most agents in DSS are former cops, former former uh, military. But DSS, the State Department itself, likes people from all walks of life, all different experiences. And of course, if you can speak a number of languages, you know that's a force multiplier. If you've traveled the world, you know if you've been a worldly person and country X, Y, and Z, that that. That ups it too. So I mean, we got people who are, you know, uh, teachers that were, you know, bartenders were. What you know, it wasn't just. It's not just, you know, the usual military and and cops and stuff like that. It seems that I don't know if DSS tests for this, but it seems like the people who are successful successful with it tend to be very outgoing, people oriented. Um, a able like you can't get some really stoic uh person who's not who's just like hard as nails and not going to talk to anybody and only speaks five five six and seven six two <laughs> like you need right you need yeah. people who can get along on the on the local economy and right yeah you know you got to be very adaptive like i mean uh 
We get along really. I mean, our our, our role kind of jives really well with special forces. Not that we're anything. You know, we're not in the same league as special forces, obviously, but um, there is that connection there because them guys, are, you know, are taught to to work with indigenous people. We are, too. Um, and that's why ever since um, since Benghazi, you know, they call it the new normal now that uh, we got to work with special forces because those are going to be the guys that come to our embassy or consulate to save our asses when things go to hell. So when I was in uh, Indo-PACOM, I was um, working a lot with Charlie One One up in uh, Okinawa, mm -hmm. and uh, you know with Fast Pack in Tokyo because you know those are the guys that were going to come and rescue us. You know, so but yeah, we try to have the the same uh, mentality, I guess. Outlook. I think the right word is outlook is special forces in that sense where you you got to deal with the the indigenous people. You got to get along with them. You got to get right. you know it's uh, you know it's. You can't do the job without them. You just can't. Did you guys have marine security, like marine security at most of these places? Or? Okay. Uh, in Algiers, I, we did, yes. In Peshawar, of all places, we didn't. Because, again, it depends on much classificate, classified material you have there. That's really the designation of why, why they put Marines in embassies. That's kind of changed a little bit now. It's more, it's more geared towards the security. And, of course, you think of Peshawar, we had a we had a big CIA contingent there, but yet we had no marine marine security guards there. Fascinating. Talk to us and, more and, about Pakistan then, and your time in Pakistan, because it sounds like you had a really interesting experience traveling around there. I I did. Uh, you know, I was I was very lucky. Uh, again, Tariq facilitated a lot of my travel. Um, our our uh, chief of mission there was a woman named Lynn Tracy. She was the uh, she was the principal officer, and she wanted to go out and engage Pakistanis. So, to that end, you know, I try to facilitate that by going out and doing these advances to these areas that are pretty much no go zones at this point. And they were pretty much close to that back then. I don't know if you heard about Swat Valley, but I made three trips out to Swat Valley with um, Tariq, and uh, Swat Valley. I left Pakistan in August of 2007. In September of 2007, Swat Valley got overrun by the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, led by Malana Fazlula. Um, so we advanced, we advanced Swat three times. I went out to Chitral. I don't know if you ever heard of Chitral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but it's probably the most beautiful place on earth because, um, you know, Lynn wanted to go there, so Tariq and I drove there. It's 200 miles away, but it took us uh, 12 hours to get there because the roads are so bad. Right. You, you got to drive up the Lawari Pass, which is 10,000 feet above sea level. And when we got to the bottom of the pass, it was 80-something degrees. When we got to the top, there was 10 feet of snow. It was crazy. And that was in June. That was the first week of June. Um, and then we drove, and then we got to the top and came into Chitral, and it's like the, you know, it's like the land that time forgot. It's you got the Hindu Kush mountains. You got these lush valleys. Yeah, and then and then you got this group of people called the Kalaj. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they're uh, um, they're an indigenous group of people. There's about six thousand of them left, and they're they're basically remnants of Alexander the Great, and they they're they're basically Wiccans. They they worship nature and uh, some kind of and of course, the the Pakistanis are trying to convert them to Islam because that they're they're heathens, you know, and you got all that. So, but these uh, the people they dress in like these bright colors, and the women wear this crazy bright makeup. And uh, when you see them, there's such a contrast to the Pakistanis because they're all you know the women are all covered up, especially in that part of Pakistan. So, um, you know, making that trip out there was was incredible. It was, Surreal, uh, yeah. Most probably the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Really, what was what was it like going through the mountain passes? Were those like hand cut roads, narrow? It's switchbacks <laughs> yeah. getting up there, right? It was all switchback. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and it was like three hundred foot drops everywhere you looked. And yeah, Tar Tarek would always joke and say, "Oh, sir, you're you're always overlooking the side where we're going to drop." You know, uh, you know. And uh, I, I mean, I was stressed. I <laughs> just, yeah. We had to pull over a few times. Yeah, I smoked over there. I smoked a lot of cigarettes. So 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, navigating those hand cut roads and those oh my God. areas are, are yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. I got a couple of pictures of my book of it, you know, so. Yeah. But, um, you, you, yeah, it was, woof, yeah. What, what was it like working with, I mean, was she able to, ever able to go out to those tribal areas that you advanced and? Yeah, we went out to the Kyber Pass a lot. Everybody, everybody in the U.S. government wants to go to the Kyber Pass, you know, because it's the pass that leads into Afghanistan it's where Alexander the Great came through, where Tamerlane came through, where the British Raj came through. Mm -hmm. Every invader in history has come through the Khyber Pass. Everybody wanted to go out there. And the Pakistani military unit, the Frontier uh, Corps, uh, which is basically uh, the Frontier Corps is this bunch of local tribesmen to work that are a, a paramilitary organization and they're commanded by Punjabi uh, officers not Pashtun, so you got that element going on. Um, and in that area of Pakistan, they hate Punjabis, but the Punjabis run the country. Mm -hmm. So you got that element going on. So the, uh, you know, the, the Frontier Corps, you know, was uh, responsible for security out there. And uh, we'd go out there and they would have, uh, they'd put on, they'd pro help provide security and they would give a, a detailed, uh, presentation about the history of the Kuiper Pass and and so forth. So we took a lot of people out there. Um, I did take some people into the Quorum Tribal Agency, which was uh, the Narcotics Affairs section, because again, Uncle Sam was building roads in the tribal areas to uh, to, to basically give the, the locals there the ability to grow crops and transport them on these roads so they wouldn't grow um, poppy. Mm -hmm. So the, the program was actually very successful. Believe it or not, they, really? there's less, a hell of a lot less poppy in the tribal areas than there is in Afghanistan. And uh, so I, I got to go out to Quorum Tribal Agency and um, to Parachinar, and uh, we stayed at these cottages that were built by the British Raj that the Pakistanis were using. Now we got to go to the foot of uh, Tora Bora. I got a picture in front of Tora Bora, so that was cool. Um, so I, I did see a lot of Quorum. Uh, we drove we drove all around the Quorum Tribal Agency to the point where we we're on the Afghan border, and you could see the American fogs on the other side. Yeah, so it's well, pretty cool. And in those, out of curiosity, in those tribal agencies, did they did they recognize nation borders, or did the tribal agencies extend? Yeah, they. Uh, you know the Duran line, right? The line that yeah. separates Afghanistan and Pakistan. The locals don't don't recognize it. Because when they put the Duran line there in uh, the 1890s, I think it was, it was basically drawn up by the British. They they wanted to uh, create this uh, buffer zone between Russia, you know, the great game. The, you know, Russia and Britain were fighting for Central Asia at that time. So they had no, they didn't care that the Duran line basically splits up Pashtuns on both sides of the mm -hmm. of the Afghan and, and Pakistan border. So the Pashtuns in the tribal areas, the Pashtuns on the other side of the border, they don't recognize the Duran line. They say it's bullshit. You know, they believe that if you ask an Afghan, they'll tell you that Peshawar is part of Afghanistan. Because it was at one time, you know, so they still believe that. Uh, something you had mentioned to me earlier, Steve, was uh, there's one significant event where a, a friend of yours, the police chief, was killed by a suicide bomber. Yeah, that was uh, Malik Saad. Um, he was a great guy. Um, he was the chief city police officer of, of Peshawar. He was the chief of police. And uh, Tarek and I established a relationship with him. We go and visit him uh, at least every couple of weeks just to I, I asked him for a lot he helped us out a lot with security so but i didn't want to be that guy i wanted to be the guy that you know went there as a friend just to say hi so uh, we became really good friends um at that time there was a a low intensity bombing campaign that was beginning in peshawar and when, my year in peshawar we had 21 bombings in the city some big some not so big but it got bad and uh, so we were trying, the FBI, this agent, Matt Gorham, 
God, God bless him. Uh, he, he, he came to Peshawar a lot and was trying to train um, the local police how to do EOD um, work. So, mm. because they were just having a hell of a time dealing with uh, the bombings that were going on. And Malik Saad was like, uh, he was basically our, our number one contact. So, we had a lot of meetings with him about, you know, trying to train the cops how to do post blast investigations. And Matt, Matt led the way on that. So um, he did, he did God's work trying to, trying to teach these guys how to, to do that. And uh, so anyways, I became really close to Malik Saad. Tarek and I really did. And um, I, I went there for lunch on a Monday. I'm sorry, on a Friday, I went, we dropped by for lunch and I invited them to my, uh, my house for dinner. And uh, he said, I can't come to your house because the ISI thinks I'm in your pocket. <laughs> so let's uh, let's have a let's have a, a, a get together at the Pro Continental Hotel. That way, it's you know out in the open, nobody will think anything. But if I come to your house, they're gonna think you know I'm a I'm a spy for America. Blah right. blah blah. And I was like, okay, you know, we'll plan something. So that was a Friday. The next day, um, there was a bombing in the city, and uh, in in the but in the bazaar and uh, Kasahani Bazaar. And it was, we heard it was bad. So, of course, what am I doing? I'm calling him. And I'm calling him. He's not answering. He's not answering. And we're like, what the? I guess he's busy. You know, he's, he's probably doing the investigation because he was a hands-on guy. And then uh, our public affairs, we had, a, we had, you know, we had a lot of uh, local Pakistanis, not just in security working for the embassy, for the consulate, but public affairs, political affairs, and so forth. Our Pakistani public affairs officers called me up at about 11 o'clock that night and said, uh, you know, Malik Saad's dead. You know, he was, a, he was the target. And what it was, it was the, uh, there was an Ashura procession for the Shia. Mm -hmm. And he he took his whole, he was a guy that, uh, he, you know, he, uh, very proactive, took his whole, uh, chain of command with him to, uh, oversee that. And uh, I guess a suicide bomber walked up to him and I guess one of his guys noticed it, but it was too late. And he, you know, Black kicked off. off the bomb and uh, killed killed all of them, killed uh, killed him and his whole command team, wow. wiped out. So that was uh, Steve. Yeah. For for people who think of Pakistan as this homogenous, you know, just Pakistan, and they're sort of against the United States and this and that. What what? Why were there these suicide bombings, and what were the different elements at work inside Pakistan while you were there? Right. Um, you know, we've all heard about Pakistan's double game, right? You know, the, you got the Quetta Shura, you got the Haqqani Network. You know, they, they, you know, they want this, you know, this. They're worried about Afghanistan siding with India. To, you know, right, they need right. a, they always talk about strategic space, right? They want that. So anyways, they have those elements of the Pakistan that they're, I mean, I'm sorry, the Taliban, the Quetta Shura, the Haqqani Network. Well, and they're all, you know, they're all Islamic zealots and so forth. And um, so what happens is that this Taliban ends up looking inward. You know, the, the TTP is basically a spinoff of the Quetta Shura, mm -hmm. led by, they were led by Batula Massoud at that time. And they were like, well, if we're going to send our Taliban guys over the border to throw the, uh, the infidels out of there, you know, here in Pakistan, it's the same thing. And the Pakistani government was playing this game where, you know, we don't want to go too hard against these guys, even though they're killing lots of innocent people. Right. Even though they're, kill even though they're killing our own soldiers. Uh, in November of 2006, a suicide bomber killed 42 members of the Punjab regiment in Dargai, Pakistan, which was about two hours north of Peshawar. Killed 42 basic trainees um and they didn't and you know Ta i remember Tarek was a former lieutenant colonel he was beside himself and they never they never did anything and it's like why why didn't they do it you know why didn't they retaliate for that because mm -hmm. they were trying to massage that whole you know these guys this is a and we, we want to use this taliban element to do our stuff over in afghanistan but 
Now it's coming back this way. Right, you know? right, right. Right, they're fundamentalists. It's like having a, an attack dog that you can't control and comes back and bites exactly. you. Exactly. Well, and not, especially, and, especially and not now, until right? Not until SWAT was taken by the Taliban in 2007, and they were outside the gates of Islamabad that they finally wake up and say, okay, yeah, maybe we should uh, do something about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, now they're now they're really in a tight spot, right? Because the Taliban doesn't have the Americans to worry about anymore. So. Right, right. So, yeah, I'm really interested to see how that's going to play out, you know, because, you know, they've been playing this double game. They've been pulling these strings with the Taliban, basically operationalizing them now. So now, you know, now the Taliban can pretty much, you know, we don't really need you guys so much. I wonder right. how that's going to work out. Right, but, right. That's very interesting. Uh, so... Speaking of which, let's talk a little bit about your time in Afghanistan as well. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about their operating out of Bagram. Um, is there any other like notable events or uh, things that happened during your time in Afghanistan? Well, if I could just tell one more story about Peshawar. Yeah, please. of course. It's okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, when I left Peshawar, I left in August of 2007. I went to the JTTF. Uh, so I was in the JTTF for about a year. And about almost a year to the day I left uh, Peshawar, our chief of mission, Lynn Tracy, was driving to work. And she pulled out of, uh, you know, she pulled out of her driveway, um, took a ride onto what was Railway Road. And um, she all she had was a Pakistani driver and a Pakistani bodyguard with her that I had. They worked for me. And thankfully, I sent them. I sent the driver to Bill Scott Raceway to get training. And I sent the uh, the bodyguard to uh, Camp Sahala, which was a State Department training area in Pakistan. Anyways, they took it right onto Railway Road. They drove about 100 yards past the Save the Children compound. And then the TTP decided uh, they, they stopped them at the uh, intersection. Two gunmen get out and started lighting up the uh, uh, Lynn Tracy's uh, car. Mm-hmm. They, shot, they, they shot the car about, I don't know, they got about 20 rounds that hit the car. Wow. The driver reversed out like he was trained to do. And they, what, they, what the TTP did was put a rickshaw driver behind them to try to block him. Mm-hmm. He drove right through him. And uh, we saw the video from Save the Children. Comp- we, I got the video from the Save the Children compound because I went there to help with the JTTF investigation. And I knew I knew the head of security there, so he gave me the the tapes. So you can see our car backing out, and the little rickshaw driver looked like he was like treading water with his legs because our guy <laughs> slammed, slammed right through him. Got off the X. Uh, uh, the the agent in charge, the Pakistani, you know, got Lynn to get down, got her down in, in the back seat. They got the car back to the house. They made it. You know, they got off the X, and then I went there. I went there to do part of the, as part of the uh, FBI team to do the investigation. And, uh, you know, I got to, uh, it was really good to go back. Um, it had been a year and um, I saw the driver's name is Zephyr and, uh, and the uh, AI, the agent in charge was Avzal and uh, two Pashtun guys. And, um, you know, when I saw them, they were, you know, they were crying like babies, just like, you know, it was, it was, you know, it made me feel good that these guys had done what they were trained to do. And again, people, Americans don't understand that, you know, it was two guys who had, they could have just got the hell out of the goddamn car and that would have been it. You right, know? right, right. But they, they did what they were trained to do, got her back and saved her life. And, um, it's another one of those stories. Like I, I've never heard of, I mean, has it been, pub- right. that, has that been published anywhere before? You know, uh, we, uh, you know, the <laughs> again, DS, we're not, I, I swear, we're, you know, our public affairs, I don't know. We, that to me, that's a huge story. That's a huge win, you know yeah, what I mean? And yeah, yeah. It never really got out there. I got the video and we used the video and I, I don't know if they still do. They might. We use it in our training to show like getting off the X because it's a clear, you know, you, yeah. I mean, those guys, those two guys like did it textbook, you know? And, um, so, you know, and then God bless Lynn. I went and talked to her right after that, after I talked to them. And, you know, this poor woman, um, she decided that um, instead of going to her house every day, that she was going to live at the consulate. And uh, 
she basically lived, she basically stayed in her office every day oh. and she had a little room with a cot and a bathroom. And she lived in that room for like a year and a half. And, and I mean, that shows some serious dedication because this yeah. isn't the military. She could have asked to go home. She could have said, I'm out. That's right. I, I, when I went and visited her that day, I'm like, Lynn, you got, you got every right to get the hell out of here. You've been through hell. And she's right. like, no, I'm going to stay. And then I went back to Bishara one last time in um, January and February of 2009. Lynn was still there. And when I was there, you know, we, every, everybody was thinking the, the, the Pakistani Taliban were going to take over Peshawar. Lynn was still there. And then we got word, you know, the CIA guys came down and said, hey, we got some threat info. It looks like somebody, one of the Pakistani locals here at the consulate is um, giving information to the TTP about Lynn's movements. So now there was another threat against Lynn. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Lynn, you know, and she wouldn't go home. She stayed. She, she did three years there. And um, she got a she got a she got the heroism award from uh, Secretary Clinton. And, uh, you know, this little librarian of a woman definitely deserved it. So um, yeah, you know. And I write. I, that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book because you know we always get these stories about government employees. They you know lazy. They don't give a shit. You know, and somebody like Lynn Tracy, this little woman that uh, had more guts than a lot of guys That's that I awesome. know. I mean, yeah. She's, She's one of the bravest per people I've ever met, honestly. And then, you know, and then Karen, Karen Decker in uh, Afghanistan, again, it's like, you know, I wanted to tell their story, you know, like these people were amazing, you know, so. Steve, was your experience, because you only pretty much deployed to these hardship areas, was your experience with ambassadors different than other members of DSS where where they weren't there, they weren't people volunteering to go do the job. They were more like political appointees living the high life right. in the country. Yeah. So, is your experience working with these diplomats different than maybe some of your brethren and you know who yeah. worked? I think so. Um, yeah, because they're like, of course, if you go to L London or Paris, that's a political appointee, and it's a whole different ballgame. Right. So, yeah, working um, with a dude like like Chris Stevens was another one like super dedicated to the mission. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I never met him, but you know, we sent a lot of agents. We sent a lot of TDY agents to Libya, um, and all those TDY agents were what you saw in thirteen hours. They were all TDY guys, and uh, every guy that was there loved Chris Stevens. Um, he he was such a good guy. He treated everybody great. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a sad day when he was killed and, um, yeah, so he was well-respected by everybody. I, you know, um, in Algeria, I had ambassador Erdman, Richard Erdman, who was, you know, when we got there, he was a pretty cool guy. We thought, we thought he, you know, he got it after a while. He kind of got full of himself. And, uh, I think, you know, because things were quieting down in Algeria, you know, he, you know, he, we didn't have, he, we didn't. We didn't really think too highly of him. I, I'll put it that way. Uh, he never became an ambassador again. In fact, the one time I did see him a few years ago, he was running around the UN getting getting uh, foreign ministers coffee at the uh, UNGA, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, so yeah, he didn't. Uh, you know, what what would it be about an ambassador that, like, what would he do that you wouldn't think so highly of him? Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, I've. Other than him, like, again, like, again, you never can go in and say to an ambassador, you can't go here or there. Right. You know, you got to go and you got to, you got to, you got to make a recommendation. Right. And, you know, what I try to do in Peshawar and in Bagram is do my homework. And Peshawar, if, if somebody, if my, if Lynn wanted to go somewhere or if we had a CODEL coming in, congressional delegation coming in and they wanted to go somewhere, well, me and Tarek were going to advance that site. Mm-hmm. I was going to eyeball it. So if I, and I write up my report and I saw it and I'm like, you know, we can't go there. And this is why, you know, and if you make that argument, but nine out of 10 times, again, I'm, my job is try to facilitate foreign policy. So I'd say we can do this trip under these circumstances. And at this time, and you know, when you, when you talk about it that way, ambassador is kind of like, okay, yeah. All right. You're going to work with me. You know, you're not just telling me no, you know? So, I mean, so, like, for one example, uh, and, 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 um, Bagram, you know, Lynn, I had just gotten there and, uh, 
Lynn wanted to go to our Fav Airborne in Wardak. I'm sorry, uh, Karen did. And I had heard, I'd gotten reports about a lot of IDF there, and I was like, ah, I don't think we should go. And she, she, she was pissed. And she said, you don't know what you're doing, you know, you're, you're wrong. So I called the uh, S2 there, you know, and um, again, I was new to Afghanistan. I'm thinking IDF's pretty bad. But then I realized IDF only happens either early in the morning or at nighttime. So Lynn, I mean, uh, Karen was right. I was wrong. So, yeah. you know, I was like, it's like and, Karen, you're right. You know, and, I, when, and after, you know, at, at Bagram, we got rocketed on average every five days. So then I figured that out. So IDF really what didn't play into whether we could go to FOB or X, Y, or Z. You know, we understood that. So, you know, it, it, you know sometimes you got to have some humility and say, yep, yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I, that wasn't that wasn't the right call. And thankfully, uh, we went to FOB uh, Airborne and uh, it was, you know, worked out. IDF is indirect fire. Right, so, yeah. So yeah, things like yeah. rockets or mortars. And if you're not yeah. in that type of environment, it sounds like a huge deal. But then you start to learn that it's just like the way things are. Yeah, when I got into the rhythm of life at Bagram, it was like, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> so but, talk, uh, talk to us more about that, about Afghanistan, then. Uh, some of the other, uh, like, you, one thing you mentioned that you were, had some, uh, you were able to observe was the uh, elections. In yeah, I mean, uh, you know, 2014, there was a major election. There was a new a presidential election. Harvard Karzai, you know, eight years was, was up, and uh, so... Um, Big presidential election. It was Ashraf Ghani against Abdullah Abdullah and a few other guys. And, you know, our biggest concern, you know, in Bagram and with the platform there and with 10th Mountain Division was that the Taliban are going to just totally screw this election up. They're going to do everything to supplant it, make sure it doesn't happen, you know, make it so insecure, unsecure that nobody can go and vote. So uh, in April of 2014, the election was held. And, you know, I mean, there were a lot of significant acts that took place, you know, a lot of attacks, but they forestalled them all. They, they took care of it. And, and it, was a, it was by and large a successful election. You know, even when we, when we got the uh, SIG intelligence, for, you know, signal intelligence uh, intercepts of the Taliban, they were pissed off. They were like, we screwed up. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't stop this election. You know, we, you know, it, it went bad. And then uh, the election was so close that there was a runoff between Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah, and they had to do it again. They had to do it again in June. It was like, oh, my God. And then they pull it off again. So, I mean, uh, you know, being there in Afghanistan at that time, you felt like, um, you know, that maybe they could do this, you know. Maybe these guys, I mean, again, I, I the impression I got is that we, we really weren't – doing any uh, theater-type fighting. It was all CT guys, you know, the, the SEALs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Delta Special Forces guys were doing operations with with the uh, special op guys from uh, Afghanistan. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was it. You know, we were giving them backbone, and they seemed to be doing the job. And so it's so disappointing now to see, you know, these reports that, you know, it's all falling apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, one of the guys actually here had a question for us about that. Uh, well, I'll just go in order and we'll get to it. Uh, Casey says, I'm a former uh, MSG. I've got a lot of respect for you and the fellow DSS agents. Did you have a good experience with your Marines and their command? Oh, yeah. I mean, my God, uh, our Marines in Algiers were, they were awesome. I mean, they're, they're part of the family, you know? I mean, it's like, Think about this. The MSGs are the only military unit that reports to a civilian entity. The MSGs report to the regional security officer. So uh, they're, they're the team. You know, they're, RSOs and MSGs are like brothers. I mean, we're, I mean, it's a great relationship. And uh, if I could just real quickly mm -hmm. shout out, shout out to uh, RSOs out in Kabul right now. Our MSGs, our Gurkhas, we have Gurkhas there. Um, and, you know, just shout out to those guys. Um, you know, we're thinking about you. We really, we're, you know, we're pulling for you to, to hold the line, you know. Uh, one of the guys there right now was with me in Bagram, this kid named Ryan Sheezer. He was like my deputy. Um, he, I talked to him last week. 
And he went back up to Bagram and he saw the last soldier get on the last plane out of Bagram last week. Wow. Yeah. So it was like there was a little bit of symmetry there. He was there with me. He was doing protection with, for Karen. He, you know, this, this kid was, uh, I mean, I could have done my job without him and just, he's a great guy. And I, Ryan, if you're listening, I hope you're doing well, buddy. This you one's know? for you, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. Caleb says Operation Anaconda was near the Kaibar Pass. Peter says, oh, here it is. Uh, open question. How do you guys feel about the closing down of Bagram Airfield? The Taliban recently overran uh, Argandab Valley recently. Argandab. Uh, Argandab. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, where uh, Peter served. So, yeah, Steve, how do you feel about all of that? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's, I feel terrible about it. You know, I mean, it's like I, I know I, you know, I've talked to some soldiers, and I, you know, again, I'm not as, I didn't, I didn't do that kind of work. Uh, I mean, I was, I was going to fobs all the time, and you know, worried about green on blue attacks and that kind of thing. And but those guys that served, you know, and you know, doing those those big operations, I know it's got to be tough. Um, I just feel like. Again, this is my opinion. I just, I don't know. I, I, I was hoping that we were going to keep a, like a two or 3,000 uh, soldiers there. Just, you know, again, to maintain CT operations and, and uh, air power and so forth and try to buck these guys up. But, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really tough right now. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, uh, you know, I know I'm, you were at Bagram too, right? Uh, I, I, only for a very short time. I, I just, okay. pa just passing through, really. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I was not in Afghanistan a whole lot, and you know, I'm I'm glad that we're getting the hell out of there. But at the same time, I understand there are so many guys out there who served in Afghanistan for a real long time. They invested, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears over there. Lost yeah. fr lost yeah. friends over there. And so I'm I'm trying not to be like too um uh blunt or or callous about you right. know. Like, like cheering that we're ending the war uh, in the sense that I, I know there's a lot of guys out there who are going through some things right now as yeah. they try to wrap their heads around what's what's currently happening, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot of mixed emotions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's like getting out of a bad relationship. There were good times, right? <laughs> yeah, there were, there were yeah. good times, and, and you you hope that we can just get back to those times, but, it, it, but at the end of the day, like, I feel like you're just throwing good money after or bad money after good money or good manager. I don't whatever the term is, but I, we, we don't we don't know what victory looks like. I I mean, in my opinion, we won when we defeated AQ there. And right, then right. It was like going to a party, having a good time, and then you stay after everybody leaves, and it's it's sort of like, well, you know, how many people. How many sons and daughters do you bury? How many families do you console for a mission that you're not quite sure what the end goal is? I guess right. that yeah. that's kind of how I feel. I wish. Yeah, I, I, Good. I get that. Yeah, I mean, I get it. But uh, yeah, it's it's tough, and I wish yeah, we did. I wish the U.S. did a better job of taking care of the indigenous who who helped us, you know, especially. Yeah, like I, yeah, your, exactly. I hope, I hope, we, you know, those people that want to come come here again, I hope we do everything we can to get them here because God, God knows they deserve it. And I, and I hate to see, you know, I know what they're going to do to them. Right. You know, that's you know the what thing. they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it, it, they're in a tough situation. Even when we're active, like you're uh, like the driver and the security uh, guy in Pakistan, they're in a tough situation. The ISI is looking at them. The Taliban is looking at them. They're, you know, it's tough. It's very tough. Uh, yeah, I mean, these people have put themselves in a really tough situation again because they want to. They want to help America. They want to be part of America. I mean, right. Good, bad, or indifferent. I don't know why, but they, 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 right. they see us as, you know, as. As a good, as as part of the good in the world, I guess I don't know, and I, you know, I hope we can take care of them. Yeah. Jim asks, can Steve discuss his uniform and loadout while he was in high threat environments such as Afghanistan? So this is like a gear, a gear and guns question. Yeah, I had an M4. Uh, I had my pistol. I had 
you know, chest rig, you know, with all my ammo, I had uh, Kevlar helmet. Yeah, you can see my picture in the um, in the book. So yeah, I had all that. I was geared up like uh, pretty much like the soldiers were, and um, so actually, thinking about the soldiers, you know, in my book, I talk about all the soldiers I met. Man, uh, I mean, what a bunch of great guys! I. You know, they talk about, I, I, I put this in my book, you know, the greatest generation. I think this is a, I think this might be the greatest generation. These guys doing four and five tours and, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, one after the other. And for, I mean, this has been going on since 2001, you know, yeah. so uh, yeah. I, I, I have nothing but love for those guys. God, I, that was the, I, I you know, I, I was always worried about traveling with Karen, you know, because, you know, it was, you know, it was dangerous to some degree and. You know, you get in a helicopter, you don't know what's going to happen. But, man, when I got in the ground, you know, and she goes in her meeting, and I'm out there with all the soldiers talking to them and hearing all their stories, and just, you know, amazing, amazing guys. And, uh, you know, incredible. Yeah. I think people bag on millennials because of a lot of the common, like, oh. social media images, but they're also the yeah. people who have been fighting the war for 20 years. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're exactly. The same, I mean, yeah. Well, like the point, uh, 0.03% of them. But yeah, exactly. Well, I, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, I'm talking to a kid who's 28 years old, and he's like his fourth tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just like holy yeah. shit, it's like jeez. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, nonetheless, it's an all volunteer force, and enough of them have manned up that they were yeah. able to fulfill, you know, the mission yeah. requirements. Absolutely, Steve. Absolutely. Since you were in DSS prior to 9/11, and then that happened, and then. You deployed in more tactical situations, and then Benghazi happened. Can you tell us about the if the training and the equipment, things like that, evolved over time when people started realizing the mission was a little different? Yeah, like we, uh, well, nine eleven happened. I can tell you my quick story of nine eleven. For me, I was at the Washington field office, and I went into the assistant special agent in charge's office to give him a report about a a case I had just closed. And he had a little TV in his office, and the, the first plane had hit the tower. And he's like, can you believe this? Some guy drove into the, flew into the tower, you know? And yeah. We're talking about plane crashes, and mm -hmm. someone else walks in. And then as we're talking about plane, we watch the second plane come in, and we're like, oh, shit. This is, this is a real deal. So I was protecting. I was assigned at that time to Prince Bandar, who was the Saudi ambassador to the U.S., and uh, I had to go to his house. <laughs> so I spent 9-11 at Prince Bandar's house. Wow. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> and then the next day, you know, anyway, so we're, yeah, we're at Prince Bandar's house. It's like me and three other guys. And uh, they always had great lunches there. They always fed us. So, you know, you probably know the Saudis take really good care yeah, of you. Yeah, they do, yeah. So we're, we're in their little lunch room there and the deputy chief of mission comes in and he sees, you know, he sees us guys, we're all Americans. And he's like, I have to, I have to tell you boys that none of our boys were involved in that. I, I can tell you that right now. It's like, okay, sir. Sure. You know? And then of course, you know, we all, we all know what happened after that. We found out 16 of the 19 guys were Saudis. And <laughs> so the next day we have to go to the white house because Prince Bandar is going to meet with president Bush. So I advanced the meeting at the White House. And, uh, you know, overnight, Constitution, you know, Roosevelt Bridge, Constitution Ave has become uh, basically a, a National Guard. It's just, you know, hundreds of National Guard troops there, checkpoints all the way to the White House. It took us hours to get from McLean, Virginia to the White House to do the advance. So I advanced that meeting, you know, uh, Woodward talks about it in Bush, Bush at War. So, I've, again, I'm a footnote in history. I'm at that, at that meeting. And then we go from there to the Pentagon. The Pentagon's still smoking from the day before. And uh, Pandar's going to be with uh, General Shelton, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff then. And then uh, we end up talking with our Rumsfeld's uh, protective detail, and they were telling us how... Rumsfeld the day before was out there pulling people out of the rubble and all that. So, you know, that was my, my first, you know, nine 11 story. You know, it was like nine 11. I spent the day at Prince Bandar's house. Nine 12 was a whole different ball. You know, it was just, you know, wow. It's like, we're, 
it's a whole new world now, you know? Right. So I'll never forget that. And then, um, so Afghanistan happens. We invade in Afghanistan. Everything goes well. DS agents open up the embassy in Kabul. And then um, Hamid Karzai is, you know, eventually becomes president. He had special forces. I think Delta was protecting him for a while. He got, they attacked him in Kandahar and so forth. So he didn't have a protective detail, and, and uh, DOD didn't want to protect him anymore. So we had DS agents protecting Harman Karzai for, I want to say, about a year, maybe two years. Nobody probably knows that. So um, so that happened. And then, of course, you know, the invasion of uh, Iraq happens, and we got to reopen that embassy. And, um, you know, and of course, we have all these agents in Iraq when it all goes to hell, you know, during the insurgency. And we got to we got to train up our guys to basically become paramilitary agents. And uh, we created this high threat. It's called Atlas. It's called uh, Advanced Training, a lot, Advanced Training, and Leadership and Security. So it's called Atlas. And uh, it's like a it's like a little paramilitary course that lasted about six weeks. Um. It expanded to like 11 weeks for a while and came back down to six because, again, DS agents have dual missions, right? We need enough agents to work in our field offices to do protection and investigations and then enough to go work overseas. So sending them to these training periods for 11 weeks really shorted out our field offices. Right. So we had, to, you know, we had to deal with that. So we shortened the training. We try to give it, you know... We do things like uh, tactical medical, you know, live tissue training. We do all that stuff, you know, uh, arrivals and departures, you know, um, well, tons of uh, firearms work, you know. But anyways, it kind of got it kind of got shortened up because of of the tempo. Uh, we just didn't have enough agents. Mm -hmm. and then Benghazi comes. Benghazi comes. Now, we have the embassy in Libya, and we have the diplomatic compound in Benghazi because Benghazi is where the, the revolution against Gaddafi started. So that's why we had that representation there. And the RSO in Libya had pushed for all kinds of um, enhan security enhancements for that compound, and he was turned down all the time. And it was, well, and it was below Hillary Clinton's... Um, you know, pay grade. It was, it was, it was us guys. It was, it was senior DS saying, nah, we're not going to throw money into that because we're going to, we're going to get rid of it at some point. Mm -hmm. And then we're sending TDY agents to uh, Benghazi, uh, young, mostly kids, you know, now granted some of them had military backgrounds, some didn't, whatever, but it all depends on who's there at the time, you know? So, you know, and then Benghazi happens, and you can blame, you know, you can blame the, the guys that were there, but we did them a disservice. We hung them out to dry by not doing the uh, security enhancements mm -hmm. that would have made that place a harder target. And we, we pretty much set them guys up for failure. So, uh, and that was a hard lesson to learn because, again, DS, like I told you earlier, we're, we've been used to get, completing the mission with less than what we should have. Right. And it, it caught up with us in Benghazi. Right. I think, I think any DS agent will tell you that. I, I don't know that I've heard anybody actually blame them. Like, I think a lot, I mean, maybe, maybe you guys haven't, maybe you have since you're in DS and, and uh, heard, but I think the people knew that. There, that the, there were people that threw shade on them because of yeah. Ambassador Stevens dying. And they're like, well, that was your guy. Why weren't, you know, that right, kind of right, right, right. Well, there's a couple of things. Um, Scott Wickland was the You know, when you read 13 Hours and you see the movie, you know, S Scott Wickland was with the ambassador, Chris Stevens. Now, a little bit of background about Scott. He was a Navy rescue swimmer before he became a DS agent. So he's got good lung capacity. So when that place caught on fire, diesel smoke took the whole, you know, right. wiped the place out. And he's crawling, crawling through the dark. He, he's got you know, Ambassador Stevens behind him. He gets to the window. He turns around to, you know, to, to grab him, and he's gone. Mm -hmm. He got out. 
he went back in, you know, I, I actually sat down with Scott and he told me this whole story and um, over a couple of beers in DC before I went to Afghanistan, I ran into him and uh, he's telling me I was Steve. I went in there four or five times. I couldn't find him. He's like, that's horrible. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And like uh, his lungs now yeah. are so bad yeah. that he has, he's basically got emphysema. So he can't do any, he, he can't do any uh, high threat tours. He he only can go to certain places now because of the medical condition he's got. But the only thing that saved him was that he was a, a Navy rescue swimmer and he had the lung capacity. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise he'd be dead too. So I feel bad for him because you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. that that portrayal of you know it wasn't necessarily bad, but it, you know. I think a lot and of people yeah. don't understand also that. The diesel smoke is not smoke like you encounter oh. in a house fire. Like yeah. just a small exposure to that kind of smoke will 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 damage you. Will render you oh, most yeah. people unconscious. Yeah. So he's lucky he's alive, but but he's 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 yeah. Poor you know Scott. He's got it's been tough on him. You know. So, and then there was somebody else there who was former special forces. Yeah, right? there was another guy there named Ray Burt. Ray, Ray, uh, you know, was mentioned a little bit in the book and not in the movie. Um, but Ray, Ray was uh, was there when that happened. Uh, Ray worked with me when I was in Bagram and he was in Kabul. He ran the personnel uh, recovery team in Kabul, so he's former special forces, very accomplished guy. Um. When he was in Kabul, he told me that uh, Michael Bay had called him up and wanted to talk to him, called the embassy up and said, I want to talk to Ray Burt. And, uh, you know, M DSS was like, yeah, no, no. So because of that, I think he wasn't really mentioned in the, you know, he, he wasn't portrayed in the movie. Right. But Ray tells me that he was on the roof with those guys and he, he, he killed a lot of bad guys with those guys. And, you know, he did his thing. So I want to give a shout out to Ray. Ray's a good guy. Last I heard of him he was a air or so in uh panama city so panama city panama so but ray's a, a stand-up guy and um uh, you know and, and the other thing ray told me was when the you know and if you remember the movie in the book when they initially got overrun the compound got overrun you know i asked ray I says like what why didn't you guys fire and he's like it's like steve uh, there was so many of these guys if yeah. i if i stay where i was and and started shooting at them, they would have killed me. It so was a suicide I, you know, mission. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Marco uh, says, uh, PSB guy here worked with DSS and RSOs often. They're invaluable when we run through. Uh, my question, I think you kind of answered this, um, unless there's something else you want to say about it, is um, about changes in DSS training in the past 10 years. Yeah, so now we've expanded... Um, this high threat training, this Atlas training to back to like 12 weeks. Oh, okay. okay. And, and it pretty much covers, I mean, we're basically doing, uh, I mean, we're doing everything but close with and kill it, destroy the enemy. You know what I mean? Right. It's like we're doing land navigation and it's kind of like, I don't know if we need, you know, but they're throwing everything at us now. And uh, it really has expanded the training regimen. You know, when you initially come on as DS, you're going through like six to seven months of training. And then you go to a field office. And then we send you back to high threat so you can get ready to go overseas. And it's another 11 to 12 weeks. So, yeah, we've, uh, you know, we got, I mean, I worked at, uh, I, I, I was an instructor at our academy for two years. We have former Delta guys training us. We got former uh, Special Forces guys. We got one of the guys who runs the program, uh, trained Los Pepes in Colombia. You know, I mean, these guys are accomplished another guy was in uh you know mogadishu i mean so these you know we're, we're getting the tr we're getting trained by the best of the best you know retired special forces delta guys are training us now so and and they they have been for quite a while but even more so now uh Clonine mills says great podcast guys keep up the great work and Andrew says, wasn't there something weird with Boris Yeltsin's protection detail before he was president when he was protected protected when he was protected by a US team? I think that's what he means. Um the only <laughs> I did hear a story about Yeltsin when he came to DC. Uh on a president he was the president of Russia. And he know, was after... drunk off his ass all the time, right? Right, right. So 
You know, when a, when a head of state comes to D.C., they stay at the Blair House. I don't know if you know that, but the Blair House is across the street from the White House. So we had a DS team on him at the Blair House. And like uh, in the middle of the night, he came down to the kitchen totally nude looking for vodka because he was you know, shit face. So <laughs> that was the story I heard. I mean, I, I had just gotten on DS and heard this story, so. I don't know, but I, I did hear that story that he, he was like in the kitchen. Everybody's like, holy shit, the guy's, you know, he's totally nude. He's like, Where's the vodka? How, how relaxed or strict is like the State Department with you guys for the bad behavior of, of diplomats coming to the United States? Like sometimes I'm sure you guys have to just sit around and watch them do shit that you know is not right, but you're not going to, you can't tell them not to do it. Do you yeah, guys I, get in trouble for that? No, I mean, like, uh, I'm trying to think of like, you know, I mean, the stuff we see mostly was like New York, you know, when they come for the UN General Assembly, you know, there's certain, um, you know, you got the Israelis who are really like, they're really balls to the wall. They, they, they get on the ground and they, and they're, they're going everywhere well into the night doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, they have that reputation. Um, they, they run a detail ragged. Uh, but I never like, I never saw anything that was like, Oh boy, you know? Yeah. You know, I never, I did go like when I was in Belgrade, the ambassador, you know, another side story of the, the, the Belgrade thing. I, I forgot to mention our ambassador had an interpreter who was Serbian, who was tied. We, we, you know, we figured out she was tied to Serbian intelligence. So it was a counterintelligence problem. And he had the huts for her. And we, you know, he was basically having an affair with her. So not only were we there to protect him, but we were also there to, to monitor that situation. And, right. Uh, he ended up going out with her to a party one night to like four o'clock in the morning. And I was, me and my other agent counterpart and all our Serbian guys were there Hanging out till like four in the morning, watching him get drunk and uh, you know, run around with this uh, you know, the, his interpreter there. But uh, um, but I, you know, I I didn't see uh, the, any of our foreign guys doing anything like that. Nah, no, nothing, nothing, nothing crazy. So, guys, I hope you'll check out Steve's book, Afghans Never Smile. Uh, and also, please remember to subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we go live. Select all notifications because sometimes they don't tell you. Uh, and down in the description to this video, there is a link to our Patreon page to get access to the bonus segments. Uh, there's a link to the merch. We're on Instagram. We are on Instagram. There's an Instagram page. Uh, is it at the dot team how dot? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there, there's a link to it right on the front page of yeah. our YouTube channel. You can check it out there. So it's Team House? The, I think it's the dot team dot house. Yeah, I believe Cause so. Because there's, there's, there's another Jack Murphy on Instagram that's... That's 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 me, but there's an actual Team House. Okay. Well, there, there's okay. another, there's okay. another Jack Murphy who's <laughs> who's a journalist, though, I think. Yeah, I think there's like, yeah. No, no, there's another, there's another Jack Murphy who's like an alt-right masculinity expert. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is that your alter ego? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. him. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. That night. <laughs> so out. uh so uh you went to Afghanistan and then like so uh, after that, like what wait uh after after Afghanistan I uh I came back and I actually was the DS representative at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Okay. So I was I was responsible for all our new agents getting their basic training. And then I went from there to be an assistant special agent in charge at our Miami field office. And then my last assignment was uh, uh, LNO liaison, DS liaison to uh, Indo-PACOM at, uh, in, uh, at Camp Smith in Hawaii, which was a really, it was a really cool, cool job. Wait, f uh, after Pakistan, you said you're part of JT, uh, JTF. Uh, yeah, I, w I was in the JTTF for uh, three years. Can you tell us about that? And what does JTTF stand for? The Joint Terrorism Task Force. So okay. it's a, it's basically the uh, FBI-run task force, and what they try to do is get all elements 
all uh, different uh, foreign law enforcement agencies and local agencies, law enforcement agencies team together to uh, to do uh, terror, you know, counterterrorism investigations. So uh, that was a great experience. Um, uh, got to work. We, you know, we ended up working a uh, a source that was going back and forth to Pakistan for two and a half years, and uh, you know, we we made the presidential daily brief um, like three or four times, which was like pretty exciting. You know, we were, you know, our guy was giving us good info, so um, did some good things. Yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, the FBI guys treated me real well there, and um, great, great bunch of guys. I'm still friends with a lot of them, so. Good experience, and uh, they do God's work. I mean, you know, uh, after I left, of course, we had the Pulse nightclub shooting, and uh, they did the uh, lead on that investigation. And um, Ron Harper was the uh, assistant special agent in charge of the FBI office in Orlando, ran that investigation, and um, you know, it was just a horrible thing. And uh, Ron, Ron did such a great job, you know, leading his team to to figure that all out. And so then what, uh, after 21 years, you retire from DSS, uh, where have you found yourself today? What led to you writing this book? Well, I think that today, right now, I'm kind of like in between jobs, um, but I'm doing uh, background investigations for the State Department to keep me busy. Uh, I wrote the book for, you know, one thing I, I just felt like, most, I mean, not much is known about DSS anyways. Right. But the fact that we're in non-permissive environments, you know, every day in places like Kabul and Bagram and, uh, you know, we're in, we're in, we're in Mogadishu. We were, we were in Sana'a, Yemen, but we pulled out because of the, you know, the, the war with the Houthis and all that. So I, I just wanted to educate people about, you know, about, the, you know, the heart, you know, the, DSS agents in the in these kind of places and what you know high threat, critical threat posts all over the world. We're there every day, 365 days a year, and I just don't think people knew that, you know. Yeah. So I wanted to educate people about that. The other thing was I wanted to kind of highlight I think Lynn and Karen because uh, there to me like you know we've all heard about this deep state and all this crap and and uh. I, I just want people to know that, you know, people that work for the government, you know, maybe, you know, like me, for example, I haven't liked every president, but that doesn't affect the way I do my job, mm -hmm. the way I did my job. You know, you're there to do a job, you do it. You know, you do it the best you can, no matter who's president. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to highlight two diplomats like that because uh, they did they did great work. I mean, it's, you know, it's unbelievable. And then there's, uh, you know, I also wanted to highlight the fact that these indigenous people, if you will, Muslims, Pakistanis, uh, Afghans, whatever, they go out of their way to help us. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and they don't get a hell of a lot out of it, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, I want, you know, I want people to understand that, 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 you know, we can't do our job. We can't protect this country without the help of other people. And these are really like some stories you just don't normally hear that we you know, that you've told us uh, so far on this episode. So it's really right. it's really awesome to hear all these. Can you tell us about the? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you tell us about the title? What 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 brought the title? Afghans never smile. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that was kind of a thing. Like hold, uh, hold up the book for people to see too. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There it is. But uh, you know, if you look at the picture, every time every picture I have with an Afghan, I took a picture with. <laughs> This guy's on the cover of the book. That was in uh, Sadabad at the governor at the provisional governor's compound. Everybody looks, yeah, you know, they just got that look, like they're Ryan Cheese or my buddy used to call them zombies. They looked like you know they were just, yeah. You know, I guess since 1979, these people have been fighting in a war, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, it, and it shows on their faces. Mm -hmm. uh, I met another guy who was a. He was a lieutenant. He was a Tajik lieutenant. He was a general's aide. And I met him and his bodyguard in, uh, in Matoon Hill and Coast. And um, I sat down and talked with them. I got a picture with them. And again, the same look, uh, you know, just that, that gaze that looked like it's just 
the thousand meter stare kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, is and um uh, and even the Afghans you saw around Bagram, there was that they, they always had that look like it was just so me and Ryan, like, yeah, these guys never smile, you know, they were just you know, you can just see that it's it's been war for like what, forty years, whatever right. it is. So that's where I came up with the title. Steve, can I ask, uh, would you be okay sticking around with us for a bonus segment for like 10, 15 yeah. minutes after? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Are, are there any sure. other, uh, unfortunately, since we didn't have a chance to read the book, uh, this, do, are there any other stories highlighted in it that you'd like to share with us right now? Well, yeah, you know, uh, one of those, um, I, I got to Bagram in uh, early August of 2013, and then on August 26, 2013, Fav Gosney got hit by a uh, complex attack. Um, you know, there was a V bid goes off outside the Fav, and then they sent dismounted guys in and uh, they attacked the Fav. And uh, thankfully, they repelled the attack. Now, there were Americans there and Polish soldiers. There was an American unit with Polish, uh, led by this guy, General Sokolowski. And um, I got to meet those guys about a month and a half after that attack. And, uh, you know, again, you know, talk about we need we need all our friends we can get. Everybody says, you know, I, I became great friends with the soldiers of Fog Gosney because I called them. Karen wanted to go there all the time. I felt like I was there all the time. So I became really good friends with them. And, um, you know, they told me about the polls, you know, like, hey, they were right there with us. And a general was in his office when the attack happened, and he grabs his pistol and runs to the sound of the guns, you know. And it's like, that's some pretty cool shit, you know. Mm-hmm. I was just like, wow. You know, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, NATO was on it. You know, it looked like we were going to be, we were going to leave NATO there for a while. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, Article 5 of NATO says if one country is attacked, we all, we're all attacked and we come. The only time Article 5 was initiated was when we were attacked in 9-11 all these countries came to help us and if you go to if you were in in afghanistan you ran into a lot of foreign troops now they were obviously weren't there in the numbers we were but they were there you know mm-hmm. and the poles man they were uh you know when i went out with karen and gosney the polish guys were our security team and um yeah, you know, I, I, you know, it's I appreciated that. You know, it just, yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's what it's all about. You know what I mean? Two quick ones here. Uh, Isaac asks, how often were you being followed by the ISI? Yeah, um, quite a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in my book, uh, like I was, you know, I, I we lived in University Town which was a section of Peshawar that was a pretty affluent section of Peshawar. So a lot of rich Pakistanis lived there. Actually, during the Af- during the, the war with the Soviets, Osama, Osama bin Laden lived in University Town, and uh, Hekmatyar le- lived in University Town. So it's a pretty well-known area. So the bad guys knew that all the Westerners, all the, you know, the NGOs, the diplomats, Everybody lived in university town, so they knew where we were. So when I, I when I was leaving my house in the morning, of course you go, you know, you want to vary it routes and times. You guys know that and make it hard for them to the bad guys to get you. And I had like this nice balcony to overlook the road, and I would get up in the morning and I'd get my coffee and a cigarette, and I'd watch the road for half an hour or so before I left. And then I have to make a decision. I'm going to go left or I'm going to go right. And then there was a, there was two ways to go. Uh, the main road of a Peshawar or this other road that took you by the airport. And, um, you know, that was, um, that, that, that was, that was the worst part of the day was going to work every morning. So, yeah. um, and, uh, so I, we're assuming that we're being followed by the TTP, you know, Tariki Taliban Pakistan. And, and, and the way they do it is you always see this, this, these two, two guys on a motorcycle, a little motorcycle following you all around. Yeah. You know, and you assume that that's who these guys are. But then it turns out that a lot of times 
you know, the CIA guys come back when, you know, about six months into my tour, they're like, hey, guess what? ISI has been following certain people every time they leave their house. You know, RSO, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, the CIA guys that they know about, you know, and other people, you know, that worked at the consulate. So, um, and then I guess, I think the CIA guys told them that, um, hey, you might not want to do that because you might get shot, you know, right. so they stopped. <laughs> so Well, and the problem with two guys on a motorcycle is that might be surveillance and that might be a Sparrow team, like what killed Nick Rowe in the Philippines. Like, that's a classic, yeah. like, assassination technique. You know, for one guy to drive off and the other guy to shoot. So, uh, Lassick <clears throat> asks, uh, "Did you ever learn what happened to the nuns?" I don't know what that's a reference to. Do you? Yeah, um, yeah. What? Well, believe it or not, in Swat in Swat Valley, there was a there was a there was a Catholic school in Swat Valley that was run by nuns, and uh, we advanced when we went when. Tarek and I did our advance. Lynn, Lynn went to Swat Valley to meet with all these local politicians because Swat was getting bad. And she wanted to get the story about what was going on in Swat. And uh, we, Tarek and I, uh, when we were driving through Swat, came across this, this Catholic school, which I didn't think they could have. But Tarek told me that a lot of these schools existed since the you know, the British Raj mm -hmm. and stuff, and um, the Pakistanis let it alone. But there was a mother superior that was from. They were both. They were all from the, the nuns were from Sri Lanka of all places. I don't know why. But we went and met with them, and the uh, nicest people. Um, and uh, we we set up a meeting with them and Lynn, and she went to meet them, and then. Uh, you know, I found out later when the Taliban overran um, SWAT that they took, they destroyed the school, burned it down. Wow. And I, I never found out um, what happened to the nuns. So I, you know, I always pray that they made it out of there or whatever, but the school is gone. You know, yeah. they destroyed it. All right. Last, last one. DSS versus GRS. Can a DSS agent transfer in over time? Can it? DSA can go to GRS? Or I guess that's what he's can they swap either way? Um, well, I mean, you, uh, we have, I think we have a couple of DSA agents who were in GRS. And they got to go through the same hiring process. You got to go, you know, uh, the DSS hiring is you got to, um, uh, yeah. You got to take, you know, you got to go through the, the same procedures you would to anyone else. Yeah. Uh, so, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I just wanted to let people know, uh, next episode, we're going to have Marty Peterson on. Marty was married to a CIA paramilitary officer in Laos uh, on the tail end of the Vietnam War. He was killed, and Marty steps into his jungle boots, in a sense, goes through training to become a CIA case officer, and was deployed to Moscow, where she handled a strategic asset. Um, so she was, she, she has a reputation as being a very good, uh, denied area case officer for the CIA. And this was back in the, the 1970s in the cold right. war. Yeah. Um, yeah. so we're going to have her on. I'm really excited to talk to her next episode. And, um, Steve, I hope people will go and check out your book. Afghans never smile. It's up on Amazon now. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Check it out guys. Also Isaac, uh, or yeah, Isaac said almost forgot what happened to Tariq. Yeah, that's a good question. Now he's still in Pakistan. I um, I reached out to him before I published the book. I said, "Hey, look, you know, I worry about you because I know the ISI is is terrible." I said, um, "Do you want me to change your name? You know, give it a." And he said, "No, I want you to you know use my name." So he's there. He's working. He's doing security work in Karachi, oh. um, and I worry about him because it's he's getting older now and. Karachi's a crazy place, so I uh, uh, ho hopefully he's going to retire soon. All right. Steve. Also, uh, everybody say happy birthday to Jack. It was two days ago. Uh, happy birthday! Yeah. Uh, Thirty-eight years young. All right. <laughs> Never been kissed. Yep. Uh, it's a tragedy, really. So, uh, so we'll see you guys next week with Marty. Uh, thank you, Steve. We'll do.